We understand history all too well, usually the parts we are granted access to and the way stories manage to survive. That's why they are still household names in China today. Liang Sicheng and Lin Huiyin, Xu Zhimo and Zhang Youyi. Though many of their peers in the early 20th century China have gradually disappeared in time, but history alone might not be eye-catching enough until it inspires us with melancholy reflections and compelling comparisons. That is why we are going to recount stories told by these two young ladies who are unique and shining in their own ways. Today is their time to make history. Ali Xu is a young movie director. Born in the United States, she took pride in making films while exploring different cultures and being globally minded. That way, she apparently resembles her great-grandfather, Xu Zhimo, one of the most well-known romantic poets of 20th century Chinese literature. While studying in Britain, he fell in love with English romantic poetry like that of Keats and Shelley and also influenced by the French Romantic and Symbolist poets. When he returned to China, he became a leader of modern poetry movement. I met Ali and her father Tony in Peking University during their annual visit to Beijing. Ali's great-grandfather Xu Zhimo once stayed in this university for a year before he went to study overseas. You don't choose your family, you don't choose your time period, but they could be real assets, as you can be to them. Two different generations, two critical junctures, two family stories intertwined, a legacy remembered and thriving. In search of a bright star, I ride on a limping blind horse, spurring it on into the dark night, Spurring it on into the dark night, I ride on a limping blind horse. I dash into this long dark night, seeking a bright star. Seeking a bright star, I dash into this vast darkness of the wild. Exhausted, exhausted is, the, is my riding animal. Yet the star remains visible. Yet the star remains visible. Exhausted, exhausted is the body on my saddle. Now the sky reveals a crystal-like radiance. An animal falls in the wind. A corpse lies in the dark night. Now the sky reveals a crystal-like radiance. I believe that he wrote this at the year that he was here at Peking University. Um, and I'm drawn to the ideas that he he's addressing in this poem and the the ability to find a brighter place in a dark world so he's looking for it yes urgently yeah and he references it with uh, his um, search via horse <laughs> as he's riding through the darkness yeah it, it is it's kind of interesting though I think I, I don't remember the exact time period of the romantic movement uh, in Europe and in England, he was much earlier, maybe, maybe almost like a hundred years prior, uh, and he fell in love with it. And uh, uh, and I think he he basically said that the Chinese should enjoy the same uh, experience, even though it's much later. Uh, so he he took the poetry of the Wordsworth and the Shelleys and the Byrons uh, and the John Keats and and try to make it uh, uh, you know more common in China, but but. It, it's not like just copying what other people have done. I mean, he, he really added tremendous originality to the way he did it. Mm -hmm. And I think that, that both the British who have read his poetry and the Chinese who have read both recognize that, that there was something very original with the way he did it. The Cambridge Shizumo Literature Festivals, it's been held every year. And then now we even have a new garden there to dedicate it to him. What about his works? these days that touch even you, the two of you, both as family members and as his readers. Less than a week ago, uh, we were invited to attend a, uh, a, a symphony performance of uh, Jusimu's uh, famous Second Farewell to Cambridge, 
uh, and the musical score was written by uh, Professor Ye Kuo Wei, uh, and he wrote a new musical composition that was performed. And I have to say that I was very touched when I listened to it. Uh, and uh, uh, you know, every line was uh, you know it was sung by a tenor, a very famous tenor. And so there's so much beauty and and uh, and maybe uh, a messaging in his poetry that that you you don't get the first time, you don't get the second time, maybe third or fourth time. Give me some examples. The most famous lines that everybody knows, uh, at least in Chinese, is quietly I, I am leaving, just as quietly as I came, uh, quietly I wave a farewell to the western sky of flame. Um, but but uh, th there are many other parts that describe what he sees in the river calm. Uh, I'll give you one example. Uh, the, the golden willow on the river bank, it dried in the setting sun. The colorful reflection ripples through my heart. Uh, the green plants on the riverbed, so lush and gracefully swaying in the gentle current of the calm. I'd be happy to remain a water weed. Uh, but the, the whole poem is just incredibly rich with uh, describing what he sees naturally and connections he makes with his past. So to me, I read this poem as a expression of nostalgia for better times in the past. Mm. Does that remind you of certain parts of your life, in a way? Because poems usually have the capability of having an impact on all of us, reminding us as if that's part of our lives. Yeah, I, I, I guess I didn't make that connection myself. Um, my, my life has been much smoother. <laughs> right. and, uh, Compared to his generation, yeah, his definitely. And, uh, um, I, while I've had many uh, moments of joy, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, the ups and downs have not been as dramatic as this. Xu Jimo is remembered not only for his contribution to modern Chinese literature, but also his many romances outside his marriage with Zhang Youyi. She was more than a successful entrepreneur, born in a time in China when equal opportunity for women was such a luxury. Yeah, but I, I think I've also been told from some of my family members that my life has been uh, very similar to uh, his and Zhang Yui's and the, their life of traveling. How come? Um, because I, I've been able to spend time in, in Singapore, um, going to graduate school, and I've been able to be a part of film productions um, all around the world and have directed films in the, both the U.S. And, and Hong Kong and also France. So, so I think this ability to see the world as um, your canvas is, is something that's very empowering. To he's well known about his romances uh, and he's well known for you know graduating himself from the so-called Chinese traditions uh, when it comes to families and relationships. How do you see his generation? Yeah, you know, I, I think in that sense uh, Shizumu was was, uh, I don't know what the right word is, uh, uh, groundbreaker or uh, somebody who was really trying to make a change in attitude. Uh, and so, uh, you know, he rejected the idea, the concept of, of uh, arranged marriages or the lack of a freedom of choice. Uh, and, and he felt that, that marriage should be uh, the, uh, the combination of love and, and the freedom of choosing. Uh, and so, while his colleagues were dealing with uh, their relationships and, and maybe, you know, not ideal, uh, you know, whether it be concubines or, or living with a spouse that, that you had no passion for, you know, he took the, the step to say, you know, I, I'm going to be one of the first to get a divorce and, uh, and uh, promote the concept of being able to choose. It's very interesting, the choices that they made. So I'm, I'm going to reference something that my father said, a professor uh, Professor Michelle Ye, um, in a recent talk, had said that Xu Zhimo in writing was a real game changer. And I think that he was a game changer in many ways. Um, and I think that he, he used his stubbornness and his, and his uh, will to, um, to really address what he wanted to address. And he just followed his heart. Like what? Um, this freedom of uh, love and in his relationships and um, his freedom to to pursue what he wanted to pursue 
um, with writing. At that time, China was very much close to the outside world. And the West is totally a very different system. And he was, and his peers, with just maybe 10 or 20 years experience outside, will be able to do this beautiful creation. And these creations are not without pressure and challenges back at home. So Ali, what kind of inspiration, I mean, for your generation to draw from this? I, I go back to the idea of openness. I think that when we live in a certain place, um, we're so used to the people around us, the, the places that we go. But I think that one thing that I've learned from Xu Zhimo is the ability to see the rest of the world. And I think I'm so grateful that my great-great-grandfather gave him the resources and provided him with the ability to, to travel the world and see the world because he knew what his life was back in China and he knew about the society and he was able to study it and learn from it when he went to the U.S. Like when he was in, at Clark University and Columbia, he studied uh, the role of women, but he, he was constantly remembering and thinking about women's place in society back in China. And I, I've studied uh, his thesis that's called The Status of Women in China. And in my undergraduate for my bachelor's degree, I, I compared his thesis with um, interviews that I did, about 20 interviews that I did in Shanghai. And I looked at uh, the women in urban China back in 2011. Very interesting. What have you found out? Um, I think that actually not much has changed. <laughs> really? Tell, and, tell us more about that. Um, I think that in China there's still this sense of traditionalism um, that's hard to break. Um, and I think that um, women in China do face a certain glass ceiling. Um, I think that in universities um, there's been an even number of men and women, but once you get into um, your career, I think there's still a certain glass ceiling that women have to face. But I think that's true around the world, <laughs> and I think that's something that that I would love to be a part of, that the change and the, the evolution of uh, women uh, in the workplace.